Well, hey, babe. In 1972, Magnavox released the first home console, the Odyssey, and Atari released the coin-op machine that would truly herald the dawn of gaming, Pong. But these things didn't just fall out of the sky, fully formed like a frozen cube of sewage from a plane. A lot had come before, and I'm going to show you some of those things now because that is what this is. 25 years earlier, in 1947, a patent was filed for the cathode ray tube amusement device. It would allow the user to control an on-screen spot with the aim of directing it at translucent plastic targets stuck to the screen by a static electricity. It would allow the user to do that if they'd ever bother to manufacture it, which they didn't. The device is lost to history. No pictures of the prototype exist, so I can't show you that. What you're currently looking at is a video that shows the flow of electrons through the device, which I found on YouTube. I'll level with you. I don't understand what that means. Let's move on. In 1950, engineer Joseph Cates introduced Bertie the Brain to the world at the Canadian National Exhibition. Bertie was four metres tall and existed solely to compete with humans on noughts and crosses. If he'd had consciousness, he'd have definitely wanted to kill himself. But he didn't have consciousness. Or maybe he did. I mean, how would we know? Eh. Games like Noughts and Crosses were popular with early computer scientists because of the relatively limited number of rules and possibilities the computer needed to learn in order to play competently. And in 1952, Alexander Douglas got a version commonly referred to as OXO working on a computer at the University of Cambridge. The previous year, the engineering company Ferranti revealed Nimrod at the Festival of Britain. Nimrod played a version of the ancient game Nim, in which the idea is to avoid being the person who has to pick up the last piece. If that sounds rubbish, it's because it is. But the fact that a computer could play it isn't. It's very, very clever. Well done, everyone. Really good. Fast forward a few years to 1958, and William Higginbottom created Tennis for Two for Brookhaven National Laboratory's annual public exhibition, adapting an oscilloscope to display an arc which changed based on the angle at which each player hit the ball using the attached controllers. Unlike everything we've seen before, this wasn't human versus computer. It was two player removing the need to create artificial intelligence capable of responding to the faster-paced gameplay Tennis for Two offered. It was also the first time someone had created an electronic device purely for fun, rather than to demonstrate the power and capabilities of new innovations in hardware. For some reason, games historians really hate joy, and so they've managed to come up with a reason why all the things I've told you about so far don't count as the first game, whether it's because it was on a computer, or used light bulbs instead of an electric screen for its graphics, or because they just have a kink for making things unnecessarily complicated but this next game is never disputed. Space War was created in 1962 by Steve Russell at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, better known as MIT. Again, it was a two-player game, this time set in space, with two rockets battling one another. Gameplay-wise, it's sort of a two-player version of Atari's Asteroids, with controls for thrust, rotation, shooting, and even hyperspace. Around this time, electromechanical games were coming of age as coin-operated amusements, with innovative titles like 1969 Speedway, which came complete with throttle pedal and steering wheel. Wow! In all seriousness, this is actually pretty impressive because there's no computer involved in this at all. The main image is achieved through the backlighting of translucent discs inside the cabinet. Similar diversions had been around for decades. Things like the light gun game Shoot the Bear by Seaberg in the late 40s and Namco's Periscope, digitally recreated here, bizarrely, as a mini-game in the PS2 re-release of Die Hard Arcade. It's literally the only place you can find gameplay footage of it. Why is that in that? It'd make as much sense to have episodes of Play Your Cards Right hidden in the latest Zelda game. Someone was making a re-release of a middling die-hard arcade conversion and thought, oh, you know what this needs? A perfect recreation of an obscure 1960s electromechanical submarine game. It, it makes so little sense, it's got me questioning everything. Maybe the Queen is a lizard. I digress. By 1971, the cost of electrical components had fallen to the point that Nolan Bushnell, who would bring Pong to the arcades the following year through his company Atari, had managed to create a financially viable coin-op adaptation of Space War, which he christened Computer Space. And yes, you're right, this promotional flyer is horrific. Computer Space was so called as a nod to the company that released it, Nutting Associates, who had previous success with an electromechanical quiz machine called Computer Quiz. The same year they released Computer Space, some other guys released Galaxy Game, which recreated Space War in coin-op form far more faithfully. But it was so expensive to make, it took the machine eight years to break even, which is bad businessing. By then, Nolan Bushnell and his company Atari were undisputed leaders in the field. And if you want to find out more about that, watch my video about early Atari games. Or don't. I'm not going to beg you. Please watch my Atari video.